The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm, I'm really pleased that you all could be with us today. Uh, we have um, a very important web webcast for us today. Um, we're fortunate to have the folks from NC Sarah here to share with us information about the 2018 uh, findings from the NC Sarah reporting. And so I'm going to uh, just share a little bit about how today is going to go. Um, we are going to move through um, all of the information from our presenters, and then we will take questions. And so I'll, I'll mention all of this again, but just to say that we will use questions from the question box at the end of our period. And if you could, please, if you could indicate if your question has to do with enrollments, that's the iPads part, or placements, and that was the new part that we started that was started just this year. So if you could maybe put that at the at the beginning as a tag, then it'll help us identify what type of question we're talking about. So and we'll do that after the presentations. Um, the archive of the uh, recording and the PowerPoint will be available on the SAN website, and I will be giving it to the Sarah folks, and they can put it on their website as well. I'm Cheryl Dowd. I'm the director for the State Authorization Network with WCET. And as I mentioned, we will take questions. Questions will be at the end. And just so that you know, if you're concerned that there are so many questions, because this has happened before, that we haven't gotten to all the questions. But if you put the question in the question box, it is banked for us so that I can share it with the presenters and we can send out answers to the questions following the webcast. Again, I'm Cheryl Dowd. I'm the director of the State Authorization Network, and the assistant director, Dan Silverman, is with us today as well. Our presenters are Mary Ann Boki, the associate director for policy research and state support with NC SARA, and also Terry Taylor Strout, who is the CEO and solution architect for Ascension Consulting Group. And thank you very much, Mary Ann and Terry, for being with us today. I'm going to turn it right over to them with the agenda and uh, whichever of you uh, wishes to take it away. Carol, thank you. This is Mary. I'm going to start us off today by just um, going over the agenda and then talking just a little bit about why we do this exciting and good work. Uh, and then I'm going to turn it over to Terry because really she is the one that this last summer took that deep dive into all that data that you all uh, sent to us and, and made meaning from it. So I'm going to let her take us on that journey. But first, let's just look at this agenda. We're going to go over the SARA requirements of data reporting, take a quick peek at the history and methodology, just while we're on the same page. Then Terry's really going to dive into that enrollment report finding. We'll switch gears at that point, and we'll look at the out-of-state learning placement report findings. We'll talk a bit about the requirements for 2019. And then we're going to just open this up for questions from the audience. And at the bottom here, we have uh, a note that the reports are available at that website. Um, they've been there for about a month, so they've been downloaded quite a bit. But if you haven't had a chance to do that yet, you might want to go and do that. Excuse not, me, Mary Ann. Uh, could we yeah. just check? We got a note from someone that they're not hearing sound. Um, I was wondering if somebody else could put into the box whether they're hearing uh, sound or not. Okay, they can hear just fine. I apologize. I just didn't want any information missed. And those of you that that shared, thanks so much. I really do appreciate it. Um, and then yep. we're we're to speak a little bit. Maybe uh, we're a little muffled, so maybe we need to be a little bit more articulate in how we're presenting. But just I was just noting that from the folks. So thanks so much for your help, and Marianne. I'm so sorry to have interrupted, but I just didn't want anyone to miss your good information. No worries. And you know what? Maybe I'll just turn my sound up a little bit so everyone can hear me. Um, there we go. Uh, so I was just saying that those reports are available on the website. They've been there for about a month now, so still relatively new. But lots of folks have been and downloaded those. Uh, the two reports that we're talking about, the first is the NC SARA 2018 Enrollment Report. That's what we're going to talk about first. Then we'll switch over and talk about the 2018 Out-of-State Learning Placements Report. Uh, next slide. So I always 
negotiations with just a quick reminder that Sarah was a negotiated compromise. Uh, we had a lot of people around the table when we were putting this together, and we really wanted to take into consideration institutions' goals, regulators' concerns, creditors, the regional compacts, and the national commission. And I know we've talked at length about all of those different um, players at NC Sarah, so I won't go into that now, other than to say that data reporting has always been on the agenda for NC Sarah. It was always a really important piece of the puzzle, uh, not only because uh, state regulators were interested in that, but because NC Sarah and the regional compacts were as well. It's important for us to see um, how we're doing, and one way to do that is to measure the data. So with that very quick rationale, I'm going to turn it over to Terry because she's got a lot of really good information to share with us. Um, and then we will uh, take questions at the end. So Terry. Thanks, Marianne. I appreciate it. Cheryl, can you go to the next slide, please? While she's doing that, I would just say um, the other information at that uh, data link on the NC SARA webpage, um, it, that actually includes all of the data reports that have um, been compiled to date. So in the summer of 2017, I wrote an enrollment report that was very comprehensive and included 2016, which was the pilot year. Um, and then last year, we also did a comparison to IPED. So that tab is a wealth of information about NC SARA data. It's all there and it's very transparent. So just wanted to make people aware of that. So um, in the current year, the year that was reported in the spring of 2018, um, the state of Massachusetts and the state of Florida and the territory of Puerto Rico um, all became members of SARA. Um, but the only uh, Florida had an opportunity for the institutions in the state to apply. So that this is our current SARA map. I'm sure you've seen it before, but it's almost filled in. Let's just move to the next slide, please. And what I, I just wanted to kind of make some highlights about the enrollment reports and historic methodology. So in 2016, NC SARA was very clear in the instructions to not report cells that were smaller than 10. So if an institution had less than 10 students in a given state, they were to report zero. Uh, that was resolved by the 2017 reporting, although some, some institutions do continue to kind of use that rule as an internal um, guideline. Not very many, most are really reporting all. Um, but I did want to point that out. Starting in 2018, as you all know, we um, added the out-of-state learning placements uh, reporting as well as the enrollment reporting. And this little graphic just is a reminder for those who may be kind of newer to this data. What The way the timing works is a, the student enrollment happens, for example, in this graphic in the fall of 2015. In the fall of 2015 is also the deadline to IPEDS to report those distance education enrollments. And then those same enrollments are reported to NC SARA in the spring of the following year. So when we look at this data, it's roughly a half year's worth of data. It's not a full year, but the fall enrollment reporting is the only reporting that is distance education um, to IPEDS. So that's the reason for that. Um, I would also add that um, the response rate is super high. We had um, we had 1,804 institutions who were contacted um, to submit, and of those, 1,791 did for a 99.3% response rate. Of course, reporting your data is a requirement of participating under SARA, which which uh, you know explains that, but. We, we really are reaching a point where this is very comprehensive data that identifies trends in the industry. Okay, if we go to the next slide, please. So this uh, just reports those numbers. In 2017, uh, we had 1,494 institutions were asked to submit their data and 1,477 did. And then this year, as I said, 1,804 and 1,791 is the end for our reporting. Um, we It is a year where, because the only new state was Florida, 
Um, we did have 66 Florida institutions that submitted their data this year, and that actually accounts for the lion's share of the growth in enrollment. Um, you know, it's institutions can't apply until their state becomes a member. So uh, this was a, a less, you know, there was a lot less um, movement because most of the states were already members by, by this past year. Okay, let's move to the next one, please. So let's look at institutions by sector. Um, the sector, the sectors are very interesting and important. Um, obviously, it's how our institutions operate, and um, as has historically been the, been the case, we have Sarah Sarah institutions. Fifty three percent are public institutions. Forty one percent are private nonprofit and 5.9% are for-profit institutions. And these, the sector um, changes have been pretty much the same over time um, in terms of institutions. Uh, the one thing that's new this year is two tribal institutions um, began operating under SARA and they, they, you know, they were small and there were only two of them. So they only represent 0.1%, but now we um, are reporting out the tribal sector as well as the others. Okay, if we go to the next slide, please. Um, so one of the things that we look at and, and we expect a trend here uh, to go happen over time is that um, we look at institutions, enrollments in SARA operated institutions and non-SARA. And of course, over time, the proportion of enrollments in SARA institutions has grown. So as of the current reporting period, it's 88.5% are uh, reported in SARA institutions and 11.5% in non-SARA institutions. The total enrollment reported was 1,225,022. Um, so, and again, that, that represents roughly a half year. It's just the full, full fall enrollment. And then the other thing that I would mention here is that um, the out-of-state learning uh, enrollments were lower. I mean, the proportion was lower because that was just a pilot this year and it was not required. Okay, next slide, please. So this is where we, the, the last pie chart was, um, was it number of institutions by sector. And this one is actually reported enrollment by sector. And so here you see um, that the private nonprofits actually are reporting the highest proportion of enrollment in distance education uh, courses. And again, this is using the IPEDS definition of exclusively online or exclusively distance education courses. Um, and institutions, in some cases, have their own definitions and you know, try to, try to go back and forth between the, the Department of Ed's definition and their own. But at any rate, um, the nonprofits are leading with enrollment followed by the for-profits and then public institutions, 22.5%. Now this is um, a, a place where we really need to point out that we know that the public institutions actually do have a lot of other enrollment, but they are in-state enrollment. So if you recall, um, NC Sarah, Sarah is focused primarily, you know, exclusively on distance education courses that cross state lines. And so, while our public institutions um, serve a, even, even at a distance, 75% of their distance enrollments are in their own state based on IPEDS data. And so this, this pie chart's a little off just in that it is not showing the in-state enrollment. And as a result of uh, you know, sort of the fact that it's, it's not reflective of the industry as a total in total, um, the NC SARA data committee um, has taken this under advisement and starting next year, um, institutions will also report their in-state enrollment as well as their um, out-of-state enrollment as we go forward. Okay, let's move to the next one, please. Okay, <clears throat> and so Again, the, the public institutions are primarily charged with serving in-state students. And so this is, this is really just the data point that I was talking about in the last slide. So as of the two, 2016 IPEDS reporting, um, 
the fact is that 83.9 percent of enrollments were in the same state for institutions operating under SARA, uh, while 16.1 percent were out of state. And this is really close last year. The percentages were 83.7 percent and 16.3 percent. So we're reaching a point where you know it feels like it's we're really getting stable data over time there's not there's not big fluctuations and and that's a good thing okay so if we go to the next slide i'm gonna um, turn attention to comparisons um, for the three years of data that we have and none of this is um, super surprising it's a it's a good story to tell because you know, as as time has gone by, um, many institutions have seen the benefit of SARA membership. The states have come in line and we see growth. So in 2016, there were 36 um, states and territories operating under SARA. By 2017, that number was 47. And this year we were up to 51 as identified in the um, in the map that we started with at the top of the hour. Um, I would I would highlight the, the growth in enrollment. So this is an example of how this happens is Florida came in in the fall of last year. So those institutions had roughly six months. And in six months, 66 Florida institutions applied and were approved to operate under SARA. They added 37,814 enrollments or 69.6% .6 of the enrollment growth uh, between last year and this year. So, you know, we, we still have institutions kind of coming in and out of the SARA family based on their business needs, but um, the growth is slowing just because those institutions who found it to be necessary and whose states were already members have probably made that decision. My own feeling is that um, the public's probably lag a little bit just because it takes a little bit more time for them to make the case to the powers that be, get the budget, um, organize the documentation, and do all the things that need to be done to come in as, um, as participating institutions. But uh, at this point, the only state that is not currently uh, participating is California, as everyone knows. Um, so by, you know, the increase, the increase between 2016 and 17 was 70%. And the increase between last year and this year is only 21% because really Florida was the only new state that could come in. Okay, let's drop to the next slide if we would. So, and again, this is um, reporting in SARA enrollments versus non-SARA enrollments. And as, as you would expect, the proportion of enrollments in SARA institutions, SARA participating institutions, has increased over the period of time and the proportion in non-SARA institutions has declined. There's really not a whole lot to say about that other than it's working the way it's designed to work. So I would like to uh, pause there, see if there's any questions um, that you guys have, Cheryl, on the data itself. And then I'll drop, drop into some of the um, challenges that we've had. But I just wanted to yeah. clarify any if there are any points about the numbers themselves that you want me to address now, I would do that and then we can go to the next slide. Thank you, Terry. There were two quick things that I think would be really helpful if you wouldn't mind addressing. And I can go back to the slide in particular. But one of our participants asked about slide number 10 and asked if on that slide, mistakenly showing iPads for spring, should that say Sarah? Would you like me to? Review that. Yeah, slide. We just, we just, yeah, flip it back because I don't have, we're not on the same numbering system. So if I can just look at it. Sure. Okay, so. Oh, yeah, you're right. It should be Sarah. I recreated the slide because it didn't look very good. So the, so the third column is report to Sarah. Okay. My bad. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about okay. that. Okay. Well, when um, just so that you all are aware, I will revise the slides when they're put in the archive on the SAN website. If you would like to take a look at them, they will um, have the revised. So I, I appreciate that. And thanks, Terry, for pointing that out. And then um, as we move forward, um, it was around here that we had another question is, will reporting include the iPads data 
and in parentheses, enrolled in some but not all distance education courses. Um, and if students are on campus for only a couple of weeks of classes in a semester, that is how it is characterized for iPads. Right. So the the short answer to this is that all of the, the reporting um, is exclusively distance education courses using that 100% definition that iPads uses. There's There's been a lot of other reporting. I, mean, I think it's really useful to look at the some but not all. Um, and in work that I did with WCET, we actually took some, you know, some but all, not all and added it to exclusively and said any. And that's actually the number that um, Babson Survey Research Group has used for years and years. So the exclusively online or exclusively distance education is a much smaller number um, than the reality of the world that we live in where students are, you know, uh, learning with multiple modalities all the time, but that's what the government says we need to report. And since Sarah is focused on, you know, not duplicating efforts or making anything any more confusing, you know, than it already is, th they adopted the the iPads definitions. So, and and it's actually a beautiful segue to the next the slide that I was on, which is iPads related challenges because um, I think yeah. <laughs> there you go, right on the nose, right? So um, their institutions have, in some cases, I've seen schools that had to count these things four or five different ways. Um, but the fact is that the directions say that institutions should be using the iPads definitions of distance education course. Um, there was some confusion, the second bullet point this year, um, there was an intention to start reporting the in-state enrollments this year. And so some of the instructions talked about in-state enrollments and others didn't. And so that was a particular confusion for this year's reporting. Though I will tell you that where institutions reported in-state enrollment, those that enrollment was zeroed out. It's not reflected in any of the reporting. But it will be next year. So look for a huge increase in uh, in particular in public institution enrollment next year because when we start to include the in-state which is about 80 percent um, that number is going to increase you know hundreds of percent is my estimation. Um, there remains confusion about how to report military students. Um, this, this is covered in the instructions but people still are having trouble with it and I I may, Marianne, if you want to, when you start speaking, if you would address that one, because I, I don't know that I know all the ins and outs. I'm just still seeing comments about that. Um, and then there's a, there's confusion about the territories. So the current report, uh, the current survey form actually includes some of the territories, but not all of them. And then there's another um, field that's like, other US territories and, and people are just confused about that. So one of the recommendations is to ensure that we have a, a data field for each of the territories and maybe even get rid of the other field or if we keep it to be very clear about what to put there. People are even trying to report their international enrollments at this point. Like, where do I put Canada? You're just like, okay, let's, I'll take a deep breath and remember what the parameters of this is. So. Um, so there's just, you know, there's there's just still some confusion. I think I think it comes because people are supposed to disaggregate what they reported to iPads, and they're really trying to make their numbers match. Which I, you know, as a numbers person, I really appreciate that attention to detail. And people will even put in the comments field why it's off by three, which I think is a testament to how seriously people are taking this work and um, how transparent they're willing to be with it. So we've come a really long way, I feel like in two years, re you know, regarding the process and how the forms work, but we still, you know, I think if we could clean a little bit of this up, it would be very helpful. Um, so let's go to the next slide. So those were the, the issues related to iPads specifically, then there are just still some other kind of funky things. Um, this one I noticed when I first started working with this data the summer before last is um, some of the data forms 
alphabetize the states by the name of the state and other in other places it's the it's alphabetized by the abbreviation of the state name and that puts things in different orders so one of my concerns is just being as clear as we can so that there isn't uh, there aren't any data errors on the input side because if you alphabetize there's a lot of you know th there's a lot of difference if if you alphabetize in the different ways and as people are filling in those forms we just want to make sure that they're really putting in what's in Alaska and not in Arkansas if you will um, there's some other challenges that people have that that they report in some cases for example an institution may only offer courses in the summer. It's, you know, the way their programs are designed, they only do online in the summer, in which case they're reporting all zeros because that's not fall enrollment, but it's also not a realistic assessment of, of what they do. Um, and so the other, the other would be rolling enrollments. I know this is a problem for probably a larger number of institutions is they may have courses that start every five weeks or once a week or whatever. And so that date on a calendar that says fall enrollment ends on, you know, whatever date in October is false in terms of the reality of what their enrollment looks like, but it's the rules that they have to live by. Um, and as I'd mentioned before, there are some institutions who are still not using the requested reporting strategy of reporting all, all enrollment in a state, regardless of how small it is, um, due to privacy issues. So, so that's, um, that's the end of my comment. Marianne, I'd ask you to um, jump in on the military bit, and then um, we can take some questions and then turn <coughs> attention to the learning placements. Yeah, sure. Um, so for the military one, really, you just report as you do to iPads, which I know is frustrating because in that case, in, or in many cases, then you won't be reporting it. For the enrollment, or I'm sorry, for the learning placements, we'll talk about that piece um, in just a few minutes because that is a little bit different. Um, I would also just have a big thank you to everyone. Even though we did have some reporting challenges, for the most part, this year's data collection went very, very well, at least from the NC Sarah point of view. Um, institutions did their reporting on time. We had very few questions, honestly, that we got on the phone or in email. For the most part, folks are getting the hang of this and kind of know how to do it. They've set some processes in place in their own institutions, so they kind of have a handle on how to report some of these um, kind of more iffy type things that are on the fringe. But for the most part, it went very, very well. We're thrilled with the response rate. I will just say a quick thing about the non-reporters because I know people have questions about that. We are aware of who those non-reporters are. And let me tell you, out of those 13 people, or 13 institutions rather, I would say 10 of them actually called or emailed us either before the, um, the window closed for reporting or soon thereafter and said, hey, we've got a problem and can we talk? And we did, and none of them were repeat offenders. They all had very, very good reasons for what happened. We worked with them so that next year they're going to be able to do this. Um, there were even a few cases of some technological glitches that happened, and this does happen. So, um, you know, we're here to help you, uh, not to throw you under the bus or to punish you, but I just want people to know that those folks or those institutions that didn't report were very upfront about it. We know who they are. They're on, they're on board for next year, and all should go well. Um, but for the most part, we're very, very happy with the enrollment report and with the good work that, that you all at institutions really did. So great job. With that, I'll throw it back over to Terry. Great. Okay, well, then let's move on to learning placements. So um, this would be another um, big thank you because we knew that this one was going to be, you know, we just had to kind of start somewhere. We, as a data committee, went through a process of trying to figure out, you know, should we should we come up with which SIP codes are available? And then we went back and forth and decided, no, you know, list them all and let's, you know, just again, transparency, put it all out there and let's see where things fall. So it's important to understand what the learning placements are. I, I think probably most of the people on the phone are fair, fairly familiar with this. But, you know, there, it's an important part of, of 
programs. And so, um, and these learning placements have been happening across state lines for a long time. And it was, you know, nobody really has sense of the size of it or anything. And so this was a place to start. It was just a pilot. And, um, and so what happened is, if you go to the next slide, please, Cheryl. And what happened is we followed the same um, we followed the same methodology that we did for the enrollment report. Um, and so a link was sent to the main contact for all 1800 and, 1,804 institutions, uh, just as we did for enrollment, and, um, and they were sent a link. And so this slide really just talks about why. Why are we doing this? It's really not to torture you. Um, it really is because NC Sarah promised at the creation of Sarah, uh, there were promises made to um, the, the state regulator community that once we got the enrollment bit down, you know, and that, that reporting was stabilized and working, that attention would be turned to the out-of-state learning placements because um, everyone was concerned about this. And, um, you know, while it's a requirement, it also helps in the institutions better know where your students are and attend to meeting the professional licensure obligations that are with us now and coming in the future as well. So, um, you know, it's kind of like vitamins, right? It doesn't taste very good, but it's good for you. And, um, and so, this year was the pilot. We thought we'd start by letting people report if they, you know, if they wanted to give it a try um, and highlight those who did. And, um, you know, it was a low stakes attempt at reporting. Okay, if you go to the next one, please, Cheryl. Okay, so zip codes. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. You probably um, know all about them, but I will share just a couple of things. As I said, we, um, we put all 47 uh, two-digit zip codes out there. Um, in talking about this and in reading the documentation that went out with the link, um, you know, we're, we're, it's kind of new language. And I would propose that we um, adopt the, the language that the Department of Ed uses and, and call the, the high-level zip code, the two-digit zip code, a program area. Um, and if we do that consistently and we talk about program areas, I think it's going to make it easier as a community to talk about um, this information. So the SIP codes, the reason why Sarah is using these is because they already exist and the institutions by and large have already identified their programs with SIP codes for other um, national and state reporting, and therefore we thought it would be less of a burden than any other way that we might have done this. SIP codes have been around since 1980, and there have been three revisions. The most recent one was in the year 2000. So the main takeaway from this one is I would just encourage using that language about program area, and as I was writing it, that made it seem like it was something that you could understand a little bit better. Okay, let's look at the next one. Uh, I think that went the wrong way. So it should be summary. There we go. So 297 institutions reported. Again, you know, re reminder, this was just the pilot of those reporting institutions. 16% um, were uh, participating and then they reported 32,000, almost 33,000 total enrollments. Um, and we'll get into some of the comments and, uh, you know, areas for um, improvement for next year. Um, but again, it was it was a successful pilot and uh, we, we have a plan for how to do this next year when those numbers will be a whole lot bigger. So that's the summary. Okay, if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, one thing that we wanted to look at is, uh, you know, how did, were the institutions that reported out-of-state learning placements, were they representative of all of the SARA institutions? And considering this was a pilot and it really was just voluntary, I feel like we did a pretty good job with this. So uh, if you look at the graph there, public institutions, 53%. Um, and reported for enrollment and 49.8% of public institutions or 49% of the institutions that reported out-of-state learning were public. 
So those the the sectors are um, represented in roughly the same um, proportion as uh, as they report they reported in the enrollment report, which was good. Um, and for those interested, I think one thing that might be helpful is at the very back of that out of state learning placement report, you'll find a, a literal you know multi page listing of who those 297 institutions are. Um, we partly put them there to say thank you and, you know, shine a light on those who participated when they didn't have to. But we also thought it would be very helpful for other members to be able to look at that list and identify schools that are like them that may have some of the same challenges so that you can make those connections and start to create your own plan for how you're going to do this reporting um, in the spring of 2019, which is just around the corner. Okay, next slide, if you would, please. So to get into the data itself, um, we, and again, this is the proportion who reported out-of-state learning placements versus the, and the proportion that reported enrollment. So as we said before, the tribal institutions, that was, that's a very small number. Um, but uh, this is the actual numbers that were represented in the chart before. So 148 public institutions reported out-of-state learning placement, 130 private nonprofits, and 19 independent for-profits for the total of 297. And then the next slide is where, what, what were the, what were the placements in? And I, I don't think any of this was terribly surprising either. Um, health care by far was the largest with 62.5%. That SIP code is every profession in healthcare. And so obviously that's a big one where people do uh, internships and placements. Education was 13.5% uh, and they were the second largest named one. And then liberal arts was 6.3%. And then the 17.7 is all those other CIP codes. So the other 43 or whatever CIP codes. Um, and so, you know, this, this is a challenge for how we're going to report this in a way that's meaningful, but I, I think that this is pretty representative um, for the pilot year. We were, we felt that this was representative. Okay, um, again, this is the data. So if there's questions on data, um, we could take those now, or if not, we'll go to the next slide and talk about the recommendations for next year. Okay, so, um, Again, you know, it was the first time out, so we want to take a look at the forms and the usability of the online survey. There was some concern about the way that form worked, so you had to like put in the number, and then it was it was you kind of had to do one at a time. There wasn't a way to to go across and and do it quickly. Is my what I could glean just from looking at the um, the screenshots of it. So we're we're looking at that usability. Um, I already mentioned this issue of talking about um, the the SIP code, you know, high high end area as a program area. There were there were some other language that we had used, but that would match NCES's language in this area. Um, there were some people who couldn't figure out how to save as they went, and so we, you know, we just we, heaven knows we don't want anybody in that frustration. Um, so, you know, again, we're looking at usability, looking at um, communicating the usability so that people um, don't throw their computers out the window while they're filling out our forms. Um, and then the comment field is something that, that was instituted in the enrollment report for 2017. And, um, and it's, you know, it's just an open-ended field where you can communicate back. So I would encourage people, don't communicate a change in staff that way, because, you know, they're not going to get that. But it is a really good way to um, explain the differences or any confusion that you have. That comment field helps identify trends, you know, as they're coming so that, um, so that we can keep improving the process. Um, and then, you know, communication is always an important bit. So we just want to make it super clear that um, th this will not be an optional activity for 2019 reporting based on 2018 iPads reporting. So that is, um, those are the points that I wanted to make, Cheryl. 
on that. Um, the last is out of reporting requirements. I think I'll turn this one back over to you, Marianne, if you would. Sure. Thank you. Um, I think the the, um, the next slide, maybe? Yeah, the next slide. So that's the reporting requirements of what's going to be different next year. That feels right. like that feels yeah, yeah. like you know, Makes sense, makes sense, thank you. Um, first, let me say thank you, thank you, thank you to those who did do this voluntary um, placement data reporting. Really, so, so needed you all to go in there and just play with the forms, play with the format, give us your, your constructive feedback. It was so helpful to have that. And I would point out that we did get feedback from a variety of sources. So we did have that comment field um, on the survey itself. Terry mentioned that and we got a lot of really good comments there. But a few folks uh, sent comments to their uh, state portal entity and still others sent them to their regional directors and their compacts. And those comments and questions and concerns were kind of rounded up and sent to me uh, in mass, if you will. So I have those as well and we've gone through all of them. And we will be looking at all of these comments um, at the data meeting, which we're gonna have in early December. But let me just talk a little bit now about reporting requirements for 2019, and that is the big one, that the out-of-state learning placement reporting will be required. I know there's been some chatter about um, would that perhaps be postponed a year, would we perhaps have another volunteer year, uh, but the board met and decided that no, this is absolutely mandatory starting in 2019, particularly since the 2018 voluntary placement reporting did go so well. Like I said, we got a lot of really good constructive feedback. But believe it or not, for the most part, folks said that given a few tweaks here and there on the usability of forms, it was pretty um, straightforward. They, they knew what to do and they, they put the numbers in. So that was, that was really useful. Uh, In-state enrollment will be required. So Terry talked a little bit about that earlier on the, um, the 2018 enrollment report that we had some institutions report their in-state enrollment. Um, and next year that is going to be mandatory, so we'll be asking for that. And a few people have asked me kind of at conferences and in sidebar conversations, gosh, won't that really change the data considerably? And the answer is yes, it will, but, and this is a big but, and that is that we would never just add those numbers in without explaining it. So we're still going to be reporting the numbers as you saw them in the 2018 enrollment report. So if we were 1.1 million last year and 1.2 million this year, you know, next year I expect us to be at you know, 1.4 million, then we will have a separate column that explains the in-state enrollments um, so that we're not you know, confusing the data as we move forward. And finally, the timing of reporting window may shift. We heard a lot of folks tell us that uh, the end of May, early June, was a little bit problematic. There's lots of vacations scheduled around there. Lots of graduations are happening around there. You know, we're never going to pick the perfect window, but we may shift it a little bit earlier just so that we can analyze the data a little bit quicker and have it out um, at the beginning of the academic year instead of in mid-October. That has not been decided. We're still talking about it, um, but we'll see how, how that kind of plays out as far as deadlines. And of course, we'll always let you guys know what's happening. Let me talk just for a minute, Cheryl, if I may, about the data committee meeting. Um, and then we'll, then we'll turn it up to, uh, to questions. But we have a, a group of folks that are part of our data advisory committee. There's about seven of them now. We're trying to add an eighth one. These are data folks that represent all different and sizes of institutions and data houses, if you will, from across the country. We ask them to meet face-to-face -face once a year, and then we do have contact with them via email throughout the year if issues come up. So what I've done is put together an agenda for our next face-to-face -face meeting, which is scheduled December 3rd and 4th of this year, so just in a few more weeks, based on the common uh, suggestions uh, and just general issues that came up for both types of reporting. So this is going to be a pretty intense uh, meeting. We're going to be talking about definitions, clarifying language, uh, thinking about the parameters that we have on the, the data, 
and how we want to have you um, submit it and how we want to collect it and how we want to analyze it uh, and all those good things. So as soon as that meeting's over in early December, then um, we'll all get together at the Sarah House here and, and put together some good information that we can share with you all in early December. But let me assure you that nothing major will change. We are not going to go um, to a different way of looking at zip codes. We're going to use the same 47 ones. We're not going to go to the six digit ones. Uh, we are still going to ask you to report next year. It'll be in the May, June timeframe. Um, nothing major will change, but there, what I'm hoping is that I'm going to have a lot more clarification, a lot more definitions in that data guide that we hand out to everyone so that um, things are a little bit clearer. And also have some clarification on some of the things that we asked you to do in the forms themselves. Because even I was a little bit confused about um, what to do with all those territories that aren't in Sarah yet. So we were going to clean that up and, and make sure that we're asking things in, in a clear way. So with, with that little uh, information about the, the data advisory committee, I will turn this back over to Cheryl and see if she's got some questions for us. Oh, that was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Terry and Marianne, uh, for such an in-depth explanation of the reporting that occurred for 2018. We do have a number of questions, and we're going to go back to when we were talking about um, the enrollments. So it's earlier in the in the uh, conversation, and uh, this particular question is it refers to when there was discussion about reporting for next year. The the term next year was used. So um, the person is asking, does next year mean reporting in spring 2019 for calendar year 2018 data, or does it mean spring 2020 for calendar year 2019 data? That, that's a good question. Um, and sorry for that, that we, we weren't clear there. Uh, so we're talking about reporting year 2018 data in the spring of 2019. Okay. Um, another question. Okay. <laughs> Did I say that right? The fall 2018 data for this. You'll be reporting all your fall 2018 data in the spring of 2019. There, I think that was better. So per the per the data guide that will be coming next is what I think I understand you saying. Yes. Right. No change. There's no change. It's exactly the way it's always been. So activity happens in the fall of a year and is reported to iPads that same fall. And then that same data is reported to NC Sarah in the spring of the following year. Great. Disaggregated by state and territory. Okay. Um, the next question is, where can one find the IPEDS definitions? Uh, they're actually right in, append I think it's the first appendix of the enrollment report. All the definitions are there. Okay. Uh, the next question is, could you talk a little bit about the rationale for requiring in-state reporting since those activities aren't covered by Sarah? What is the purpose for that um, reporting? Sure. Um, so we're going to start asking folks to report in-state online reporting, distance education reporting in their state. The rationale is really twofold. The first is that that is it is online, and we wanted to to kind of capture that. But the second is that really um, institutions, believe it or not, were the were part of the reason we, we were thinking about this. Is that the mission of most public institutions is really to serve the citizens of our state, and although they do reach beyond their borders in many cases, the majority of the um, online distance education is happening in their state and so we are going to start asking folks to report that as well to get a more full picture of what's happening in distance education and i might also turn this over to terry to see if she has something to add on that um, because i think she she touched on that for a moment in her um her presentation earlier yeah thank you marianne i think that um i think that nc sarah is uniquely positioned um for the data reported by member institutions to to essentially become the de facto baseline data because um, as as we've talked about all the limitations of iPads um, you know bef before we had iPads distance education data um, people kind of pulled information from different 
places. And and so, you know, the, the population of institutions um, that report to IPEDS is around 4,400. Um, but not all of those institutions are in, engaged in distance learning, probably about half or a little bit more than a half. So with uh, Sarah having, you know, membership above 1,800 institutions, the organization uh, is reaching the point where it, the, it's the population of institutions that are in this business. And so to have a clear picture, including in-state enrollment, for that population, I think is beneficial for the industry as well as for Sarah and, and Sarah members. Um, only looking at uh, out-of-state enrollment gives us a very swayed view of enrollment and particularly for our public institutions since 80% of their exclusive distance ed enrollments are in their own state. So we're only seeing 20% of the public institution activity. When you look at the charts that show um, the proportion of public institutions that are in, that are uh, operating under SARA versus the enrollments in those public institutions, the the enrollments are much smaller than even the the nonprofits and the for profits because we're not counting all those public enrollments that are happening in the public institutions on state. So while it is it is not in alignment with the mission, the mission of SARA obviously is across state lines. But it's important to look at the whole the whole picture, and we haven't had uh, we haven't had the whole picture. Thanks very much. Uh, so just to confirm, when you were talking about this, we were talking just about the enrollment. Am I correct? And not the placements. So we're talking about doing enrollments in state, but uh, is there talk of doing placements in state as well? That's a very good question. That's come up a few times to us, and the answer is no. We're actually not thinking at all about asking institutions to report on their in-state learning placement activities. Um, that's that's not even on the table at this point. Great. Um, we have a question about slide number 25, so I'm going back there, and it talked about the percentages, and the, the person was having some confusion with the percentages and wondered if we could review again, please. Sure. So this is just, this was really, this this slide came out of the fact that we had 100 and whatever it was, 169 institutions reporting instead of 1,700, and so the question was, is you know are these representative and we couldn't have changed it if they weren't because it was all just voluntary but the point but the idea was to um compare by sector those who that reported for out-of-state learning placements which is the second column and those that re reported um enrollment and so it was fairly close so, you know 49% of those, 49.8% of the institutions that reported out-of-state learning placements were public. 43.8% were private nonprofit, where you look across the publics again, 950 institutions reported the enrollment report, which was 53% of the institutions reporting. So it was really just a way to sort of get a ballpark to say that this that the out-of-state learning placement data was in alignment at least with regard to um, sector compared to what we you know kind of have benchmarked now for with the enrollment report for a few years okay. I would just add that, that that was a really important data point for us at nc sarah uh, because had we done this voluntary placement and we only got public institutions that, that tried their hand at this, even though it was voluntary, that would have been a big red flag for us. We would have been very concerned. But what's nice about this um, is that we've got folks from different sectors inputting this data, which, which said to us that, oh, goodness, this is great news because we've got large public schools doing it. We've got uh, mid-sized private schools doing this. We have for-profits. We have small religious institutions doing this as well. We were so pleased about that because, um, you know, not only did it kind of represent to us that, that folks were willing to try and, and do this, which was wonderful, but it also meant that they, they could do it. And that was an important um, data point for us. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, mm -hmm. The next question uh, has to do with placements. And uh, so, uh, well, somebody actually wanted to know, is there an IPEDS definition of out-of-state learning placements? Is that, is that something that should be of, a, of an issue at this point? I don't think so, Terry. No, I don't think so. I don't, I'm not aware of IPEDS doing any of this, which is why yeah. the NC SARA data committee came together, you know, with the handout of all the CIP codes and said, okay, how do we take the first bite out of this elephant? Right. This, this data, having those 32,000 placements reported, there is no other data like that anywhere publicly. Now, for those of you who have been in the state authorization business a long time, remember that this sort of reporting, this out-of-state placement reporting, did in fact happen on a state-by-state -state basis. Um, there were many states that required it um, as part of your state authorization um, certification, if you will. Uh, but it wasn't public. This, the, the states that collected that data kept it for their own internal records, and that was fine. Um, the difference here is that we're collecting across the country, but we're also making it uh, publicly available. So that's that's the big difference. Thank you. Uh, we're, we're just going to take one more question at this point because we're, we're getting close to the end and we need to be able to um, to sum up and answer this last question. But I wanted to point out to all of you that I am aware that there are a number of questions that are still um, listed here. We have all these questions and we will be sharing the questions with Marianne and Terry uh, to be able to get an answer. And on the SAN website will also then be um, the list of uh Question of answers to these questions that were posed um, that we're not going to be able to get to during this time period. Um, so here, here is the last question. Um, do we re so this this uh, participant is asking? Do we report out of state placements in just major field of study? And also the the follow up to that is: Do we report out of state placement in general education courses? Yeah. So this this is a question that actually has come up a few times. So for this last reporting period in 2018, the answer is yes, that is what you did. Um, moving forward in 2019, um, it's a question I have on my, uh, on my list of things to go over with the Data Advisory Committee, but I'm guessing that the answer is gonna be yes, at least for this next year. For those of you who are, who are kind of new to this or who perhaps didn't do the, the learning placement reporting, um, let me just talk for a second about what this question means. They're wondering if, in particular, teacher education or allied health could be broken down into other categories instead of the broad category. Um, whereas I've had other people ask if some of the other, um, other internship and placements could be collapsed to kind of play with those zip codes a little bit. It's tough because we're trying to make sure that we're meeting the needs of all the different institutions and sectors that do this sort of reporting. Um, it, so anyway, so I'll, I'll leave with that. It says, yes, I'm aware of that issue. It, we are going to talk about it at the data committee meeting. Um, but because it's kind of late in the game for this year, my guess is we're going to stay with the same 47 SIP codes and not go into more detail, in particular for those allied health or education for this next, next go around. I think we just need to collect a little bit more baseline data to determine whether that makes the best sense or not. So hopefully I answered that, that question to the person's satisfaction. Thank you very much, Marianne. And to that point, if anyone is having any concerns or questions about or needing follow up to the questions that were able to be um, asked and answered, um, I'm showing the contact information here for Marianne and for Terry. So I please hope that you will take note of how you can contact them. Um, and Terry has also listed her uh, work number and her email address for you to be able to reach her as well and her website. So moving forward, um, I just want you all to be aware that WCET and SAN um, have a number of opportunities that you may want to, um, to look into on the WCET website and on the WCET SAN website. We have SAN now has its own website. So you may want to review that and, and consider membership if you're not already a member. 
There are a number of activities uh, still coming forward. In two weeks, we'll be having the Sensational Award winners um, presenting on their award-winning um, projects. Um, that will be November 28th, and you can register uh, here. You can find the, um, the link also on the SAN website. Also today, the Basics Workshop registration opened, um, so you can uh, go to the SAN website and look under events and register for the SAN Basics Web Basics Workshop. It'll be held in Arlington, Virginia, uh, near the Iwo Jima Memorial, right across from Georgetown. Um, you can see that in under resources, there's past webinars. You can find the past webinars um, that SAN has offered um, over the last year, two years. And um, some of those will only be available to SAN members. So you may want to consider that. Um, but some of them are some of the webinar uh, archives are open to the public, including um, anything that we have coordinated with Sarah. We want to thank our supporting members for their commitment to WCET. We really appreciate Colorado State, Cooley LLP, Lone Star College System, Michigan State University, University of Missouri Columbia, um, Mizzou Online, and University of North Texas. And then finally, we're really grateful to our annual sponsors. So thank you all for being on today. Thank you so much to Mary Ann and Terry. Um, for their time and their very thorough explanation of how data reporting went through. And uh, I look forward to uh, talking with you all in the future. Look forward to the um, website posting of the archive of this recording, the, the slide deck, and the answers to these questions. So I hope this has been helpful and look forward to talking to you all again soon. Take care. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you, Cheryl. Thanks, guys. Bye.